Okay, guys, we are continuing Strengths Finder 2.0. We are continuing the 34 themes of ideas and actions. Again, if you take that um, that quiz, I don't know if you have to have the book, but apparently you can't use my code that I like sent. But it's basically if you go to strengthsfinder.com, you can get your own unique access code and follow along with the book, or you can buy the book yourself. But this is just kind of like a teaser for you to do it. Um, I will reveal all my stuff after we're done doing this, like what mine came up with. Um, I think I'm probably going to take it again because I haven't taken it. I think when I did this, it was like 10 years ago, guys. So I probably have different strengths than I had then. So I'll probably retake it and then tell you what my score is at the end. But right now, I'm just going to walk you through the ones that are on here. And so you know what all of them are and you can kind of get an idea what's yours. Um, so the next one we're talking, we're going to do seven today. The one we're talking about first is belief. Um, if you possess a strong belief theme, you have certain core values that are enduring. These values vary from one person to another, but ordinarily your belief theme causes you to be family oriented, altruistic, even spiritual, and to value responsibility and high ethics, both in yourself and others. These core values affect your behavior in many ways. They give you life, meaning, and satisfaction. In your view, success is more than money and prestige. They provide you with direction, guiding you through the temptations and distractions of life toward a consistent set of priorities. This consistency is the foundation for all your relationships. Your friends call you dependable. I know where you can where you stand. They say your belief makes you easy to trust. It also demands that you find work that meshes with your values. Your work must be meaningful. It must matter to you and guided by your belief theme. It will matter only if it gives you a chance to live out your values. For sure, I know that I'm this one. Okay, belief sounds like this. Michael K, salesperson. The vast majority of my non-working time goes to my family and to the things we do in the community. I was one, I was on the court countywide Boy Scouts Board of Directors, and when I was a Boy Scout, I was a pack leader. When I was an explorer, I was junior assistant leader for the Boy Scouts. I just like being with kids. I believe that's where the future is. And I think you can do a whole lot worse with your time than investing in it in investing it in the future. Lara M, college president. My values are why I work so hard every day at my job. I put hours and hours into this job and I don't even care when I, what I get paid. I just found out that I am the lowest paid college president in my state and I don't even care. I mean, I don't do this for the money. Tracy D, airline executive. If you are not doing something important, why bother? Getting up every day and working on ways to make flying safer seems important to me, purposeful. If I didn't find this purpose in my job, I don't know if I could work through all the challenges and frustrations that get in my way. I think I would get demoralized. This one is definitely me, guys. Okay, so I volunteer with Hill Country Youth Ranch. It helps um, orphans in foster care. It's like a residential treatment facility. I've been doing that for five years now. It'll be five years in December. Um, so I have currently I have three surrogate kids. I've asked for no more just because I moved to Corpus Christi and it's in uh it's in um, Ingram, Texas, which is about three and a half hours away from here. So um, my surrogate kiddos, I like, I was told that I'm one of the best surrogate parents. So she just kept giving me more people because like, I'm really, so you mentor them, you are involved in their academics and like their special education program. You have a good relationship with their teachers, their CASAs, their caseworkers, kind of all of you're like, the like, you're basically like their parents because they don't have any, they're staying in like cabins. Um, they have birth parents that they have. So I know about their birth parents relationships, how they feel about them. I know how they feel about their caseworkers. I have like a really good relationship. I actually want to adopt from foster care. One of my surrogate kiddos that I've had for four years now, and she keeps getting thrown into psychiatric hospitals. Um, her mom committed suicide when she was a little girl. And then she lived with her stepfather who sexually abused her. Um, so she thinks that being physically touched and like in inappropriate areas by anyone is showing love. So she touches people and it like, she just, it's just, it's very sad. So like they found out she was being sexually abused by her stepfather. So then she got moved to her grandmother's house. Her grandma was probably the best role model she had, but then her grandma died. So then she got put in the foster care system. So she has no one, her stepfather, I guess she told me has been reaching out to her and I asked her how she felt about that. And she's like, well, he loves me. And I was like, does he though be like, does he really love you? Like, how does he show his love to you? And then she tells me and like, some of it is loving. Some of it is disgusting. Um, so um, anyway, so her and I came up with a plan in November. 
that my husband, my ex-husband, Aaron, and I were going to adopt her from foster care because we're working to adopt from foster care. I've wanted to adopt from foster care since I was a little girl. I've never wanted to have children biologically other than when I've been in relationships with other men who wanted to have children biologically. Those are the only times I've wanted my own children biologically. I have an IUD. Um, I had Nuverine before that. Like I'm very, very into birth control. And like, even with birth control, I would still make my husband wear a condom. Like I was that obsessed with not getting pregnant guys. So like, I was like, but like we're going to cut out all possibilities of this actually happening. I'm making sure I'm adopting for foster care. So it's like very important to me. There are 400,000 children in foster care in the U S alone. The number changes constantly. Um, Texas has 40,000 and they have the best benefits of anywhere. Like if you adopt from foster care in Texas, if you adopt a baby, I don't, I think it's kind of the same as it is everywhere. You have to pay for it, blah, blah, blah. It's not like you don't get much out of it. Um, but if you adopt a toddler, a two-year-old or up, that's the same minority as you, your child, you're like eligible for, I don't know, they give you a stipend monthly until they're 18. Um, you have to foster them for six months and then you can adopt them. They, that's their, they're very strict about that. They want to make sure it's a good fit for the child and a good fit for you. They do like visits prior to that. You, uh, it takes about one to three months to get licensed as a certified foster parent. Um, so I'm going to be doing that process by myself as a single person. Um, my ex-husband, I don't, I mean, he said he wanted to adopt when we like an, a child from Ethiopia when we first started dating. And so that was like what sold me that and that he was Christian because my college sweetheart before that, who I thought I was going to marry, didn't want to, he wanted at least one biological child and then we would adopt all the others. Um, and then I, when I asked him if he's going to love them the same, he said he didn't know. And that was kind of like strike one in my head. And then um, I kept trying to get him to go to church with me. He was agnostic. And he told me once that um, if we did have children together and we raised them together, that we could raise them whatever Christianity religion I wanted to raise them with. Um, but and he would go along with it. He would go to church. He would pretend to believe that is what he told me. And I didn't like that. I was like, you shouldn't have to pretend to be my religion. Like, what are you going to tell? Like, we, I was like, we're going to raise them both agnostic and like Christian. Like, I was like, this, this isn't going to really work. And so like, um, I was up and that was really hard. I remember like crying on the bath and the kitchen floor for like two hours. Like I could not, I couldn't like get off of the floor. I had to like literally peel myself off of the floor and then like put in a bunch of episodes of Sex in the City. And that was really all that got me through. I had like a glass of wine, candles lit and watched Sex in the City for the rest of the night. And probably for like two weeks after that. And that's like, and cried on it all for like ever. Cause I thought I was going to marry this man. And like, it was devastating. And like, we had really good communication and everything else. This is getting ahead of it. Okay. So let's get back to this. <laughs> so, so I volunteer a lot and I work a lot and I, I love working at like nonprofits and I'm a journalist. So like, I love doing things that are like for a higher purpose and like glorifying God in some way with my skills. So I would definitely say that belief is one of my strengths. Okay. So ideas for action, charity, clarify your values by thinking about one of your best days ever. How did your values play into the satisfaction that you received on that day? How can you organize your life to repeat that day as often as possible? Actively seeking roles that fit your values. In particular, think about joining organizations that define their purpose by the contribution they make to society. So I'm a member of Zonta Club, um, the only society I've ever been a member of, and they are about violence against women. And when I got arrested by a police officer and was physically and sexually assaulted, and he put me down as a felony for assaulting him, I did this to this asshole. And I have a third degree felony right now on my record that I have to try to fight and get rid of. And it's been very frustrating, um, very frustrating because the officer is should not be a police officer. He's lying. He's very aggressive. Apparently, he has a history of aggressiveness with women. And I've filed a complaint against him. The last woman who tried to sue him in the police sta station, uh, Fredericksburg, the Gillespie County Police Station, they, I guess, did everything in their power to make it stop. And they fucked with a journalist this time, guys. So they're fucking going down. I don't care if this has to go grand jury. I'm not accepting any fucking plea deal. These assholes like need to redo their entire fucking department. I've left so many messages, like so frustrating. Anyway, so like they reached out to me and were like, Chelsea, like this is, you're not the only person this happened to. And I was like, really? And so this girl saw me these stories and this like woman basically tried to sue them. And now she's like depressed and she lives in like an RV park. And it's like, really sad. And I was like, so I'm doing this for her. I'm doing this for miss myself. I'm doing this for any other woman who has been physically or sexually assaulted by a Fredericksburg police officer. And I hope that the police force goes down. I hope that whoever is in charge of running it loses their job. That is my goal. That is my end game. And if that doesn't happen, I'm going to write the shit out of this story, 
even if it has to be in prison. <laughs> okay. So the meaning and purpose of your work will often provide direction for others. Remind people why their work is important and how it makes a difference in their lives and in the lives of others. Your belief talents allow you to talk to the hearts of people, develop a purpose statement and communicate it to your family, friends, and coworkers. Your powerful emotional appeal can give them a motivating sense of contribution. Create a gallery of letters and or pictures of the people whose lives you have substantially influenced. That's a good idea. When you are feeling down or overwhelmed, remember, remind yourself of your value by looking at this gallery. I really like that idea. It will energize you and retrieve, revive your commitment to helping others. I use my yearbooks. Like I've saved all my yearbooks. I was in the yearbook committee, like all through high school. When I was senior co-editor in chief my senior year. Um, I think you could join us as a sophomore. So sophomore through senior year, like I even have on my like class ring, my like, you know, Okay, so, oh yeah, I tried to get your book, but I liked this style better. So this is my class ring. It's got my birthstone, topaz, and then my favorite color, like aqua turn. 2004 is when I graduated. Uh, friendship is the hand-holding thing. I wanted your book, but they didn't have one for this style. SLH is Shoreland Lutheran High School is where I went, and then drama. I was in drama one year. I tried to go in drama more than one year, but there were musicals every year, and I was told by my grandmother that I can't sing. Well, guess what, Grandma Heidi? Watch my fucking YouTube channel. I can sing, bitch. <laughs> okay. Stupid grandma. Okay. Um, Set aside time to ensure that you are balancing your work demands in your personal life. I do that all the time. Your devotion to your career should not come at the expense of your strong commitment to your family. Don't be afraid to give voice to your values. This will help others know who you are and how to relate to you. Actively cultivate friends who share your basic values. Do that. Consider your best friend. Does this person share your value system? I have two very close best friends. I have like, I had uh, 10 maids and mans of honor in my wedding. My brother was my man of honor and then everybody else was my maid of honor. I'm very into language and like words that you use for things. Words of affirmation is my love language, which we'll read that book another time when we're done with this probably. Um, so like I did not, I like reworded like everything. Like we, our whole like wedding party, everything was like wordsmith, like exactly how I was comfortable with and like how my husband was like approved on. And so like he was very traditional. So like his sisters were his maids, his um groomsmaids instead of bridesmaids he had two sisters stand up on his side they like asked if they were standing up on my mom was like hell no they're at they're bitches they are like the worst freaking women i've ever met in my entire life like i like mary i like katie like i respect them in some ways but in a lot of other ways i don't like katie made my life freaking miserable for like the whole 11 years that like nine years that i was engaged in part of the culture john family and i sat them all down and I asked for their blessing and they decided a month later that when we were having an argument and we reached out for them that they were going to be in control of our relationship for the rest of the years because i asked for their blessing that's how this fucking family operates so they decided to have an intervention and they brought aaron my ex-husband there and they said you need to call off the wedding chelsea is like she's a horrible person like you guys can't work out problems together like so they're like literally listing all these things that they don't like about me and some of them are really stupid like she doesn't like sports and i was like really we're gonna call off the wedding because i don't like sports like fuck you isaac okay so then like just like stupid shit and like his oldest brother ben was not he's not participating in it thank god for ben but everybody else is like literally like in like nathan like video chats in from like freaking tennessee like i'm like you guys are nuts so like aaron like i'm not i wasn't proud i had no idea what's going on so aaron shows up at my door like bawling literally like crying and shaking he's like chelsea you need to apologize to my family and i was like for what what are you where is this coming from he's like they just they all sat me down and they have like an intervention i'm like what and he's like they want me to call off the wedding and i was like excuse me i was like i just asked them for their blessing a month ago and they gave it to me now they're throwing a fucking intervention like this family was horrible good luck to the next girl good luck bitch okay partner with someone who has strong futuristic talents this person can energize you by painting a vivid picture of the direction in which you value your values will lead Accept that the values of other people might differ from your own. Express your beliefs without being judgmental. Working with others who have belief. This person is likely to be very passionate about the things closest to her heart. Yep. Discover that passion and help her connect to the work she has to do. Learn about this person's family and community. She will have made rock solid commitments to them. Understand, appreciate, and honor these commitments and she will respect you for it. You do not have to share this person's belief system, but you do have to understand it, respect it, and apply it. Otherwise, major conflicts will eventually erupt. Okay, I'm like circling this whole thing. <laughs> like, this is definitely me. I'm definitely believing. 
I don't think I knew that when I did this 10 years ago in my 20s, but I'm definitely belief now. Where's the highlighter? Okay, now we got command. Command leads you to take charge. Unlike some people, you feel no discomfort with imposing your views on others. On the contrary, once your opinion is formed, you need to share it with others. Once your goal is set, you feel restless until you have aligned others with you. You are not frightened by confrontation. Rather, you know that confrontation is the first step towards resolution. Whereas others may avoid facing up to life's unpleasantness. You feel compelled to present the facts or the truth. Ooh, I think this is me too. No matter how unpleasant it may be, you need things to be clear between people and challenge them. This is definitely me too. Okay, you need people to be clear um, and challenge them to be clear-eyed and honest. You push them to take risks. You may even intimidate them. Definitely me. And while some may resent this, labeling you opinionated, they often willingly hand you the, the reins. People are drawn toward those who take a stance and ask them to move in a certain direction. Therefore, people will be drawn to you. You have presence, you have command. Command sounds like this. Malcolm M, hospitality manager. One reason I affect people is that I'm so candid. Actually, people say that I intimidate them at first. After I work with them a year, we talk about that sometimes. They say, boy, Malcolm, when I started working here, I was scared to death. When I ask why, they say I've never worked with anyone who just said it. Whatever it was, whatever needed to be said, you just said it. Rick P, retail executive. We have a wellness program whereby if you consume less than four alcoholic beverages a week, you get $25. If you don't smoke, you get $25 a month. So one day I got a word that one of my store managers was smoking again. This was not good. He was smoking in the store, setting a bad example for the employees and claiming his $25. I just can't keep stuff like that inside. It wasn't comfortable, but I confronted him with it immediately and clearly stop doing that or you are fired. He's basically a good guy, but you can't let things like that slide. Whistleblower. Okay. Diane M. Hospice worker. I don't think of myself as assertive, but I do take charge. When you walk into a room with a dying person and his family, you have to take charge. They want you to take charge. They are a bit in shock, a bit frightened, and a bit in denial. Basically, they're confused. They need someone to tell them what is going to happen next, what they can expect, that it's not going to be fun, but that in some important ways, it will be all right. They don't want mousy and soft. They want clarity and honesty I provided. So I was an assisted living director, activities director. It's called Lifestyle. It was called Lifestyle Program 360 Director. Um, for Lifestyle 360 Program Director was their like title, but it's basically an activities director and assisted living and retirement community during COVID, guys. I started three months before COVID. And like, just when I started to get like my footing and my bearings and like figure stuff out, then COVID happened. And then all these people started dying. And I was like, it's so like I started doing research on like, because like they were so isolated and like they weren't even seeing each other. They weren't allowed to see each other. So they only saw me. They only saw like the care, like the assisted living staff. And like, so it was just like stressful and frustrating. So I decided to use the newsletter as like their connected piece. Like I would have them write in stuff and I would have them like be more proactive with it. And so like I would make sure we had activities listed, even though most of them they were going to be doing in the rooms or the hallways. So like I tried to find like a sense of community and I tried to like make sure we did hallway activities as best as we could. Like we had lots of like five star senior living. If you ever want to send your family members somewhere, look for a five star senior living community. They're like excellent, excellent. They're all over the world. I think they're all over the nation for sure, but I think they're also all over the world. And so like, they're a very good program. We had a very good team. Like people told me that my boss is very like micromanaging, but it didn't bother me because like I was new and hadn't done it before. My mom had been an activities director for 10 years. So like I got a lot of tips from her, but things have changed since then. And like, it's like, I'm a very creative person. So it allowed me to be creative and look up stuff on like Pinterest and ideas. And like, they had uh, activity connection, which was like a website that I like literally would just like scounge anytime I like had nothing going on. Um, but like my favorite thing was the newsletter because like I was, a, had just gotten out of doing special sections editing. Like we talked about interviewing the residents and doing all these other things. And I had to do that actually for my job to record each resident. And I had to like keep track of which ones were going to activities. And I had to like talk to their family members to let them know what's going on and things like that. And so um, I tried to be like out of the box as possible because it was saying that they have to all like do all 360 things. They have to do something spiritual. They have to do something emotional. They have to do something intellectual. They have to do something uh, physical. They have to do something, what was the fifth one? 
emotional, physical, spiritual. Social. So like there are some residents who did not want to come out of the room and I would just ask them why. Like I got to know them a lot better during COVID. Like I'm actually thankful for COVID because before it was like everything was a group activity. I didn't do anything in the rooms whatsoever. I wanted everybody out. And when we'd have like the monthly meeting, like I would just tell them like, you guys, I need to be documenting you coming to the activities. You guys really need to come. And like a couple of the residents just raised their hands. like, We don't want to come to the activities. We don't like them. And I'm like, well, are, am I not offering things that you want to do? And they're like, well, yeah, I don't really like bingo and I don't like this. I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to offer? That's going to get you out of your room because my job is to get you out of your room and walk around and do stuff because your family asked me, why are you in your room all the time? And they don't want you in your room all the time. They put you here specifically to get you out and doing things and like socializing and things like that. So what kind of activities do you want to do? So like, then they were just like, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. And then there were other people like, I don't want to do them. I literally just want to sit in my room and watch TV all day. I'm like, that's what you want to do. Like, I'm not going to fight you on that. That's fine. Like, so like I went there one time and like, found out she wanted her nails done. So I was like, let's do your nails. And she's like, I want my toenails done because I can't reach them and I'm blind to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, they're not going to let me do that. I was like, I can file your toenails. And she's like, I don't want you to file them. I want you to trim them. I was like, I can't trim them. They won't let me trim them. Like I can file them. And she's like, that's going to take forever, Chelsea. I was like, it's better than like nothing. Like this is all I can offer you. And she's just like frustrated. I'm like, let me try to get like podiatrist in here to like do this. So like they already had somebody doing that. So like I was trying to find the people who wanted to do that. And then when they finally opened up the store, I was like, you guys, like they want their nails done. Like that is like the big thing. Like nobody really like their hair is like what I was like, but they really need somebody to do their nails. So like I tried talking to like college students from cosmetology schools. I tried like doing all these things. They had to rent our like beauty shop. So then I got our old beautician guy to agree to do nails. And then I tried to do sign up sheets. Because, like it's just like it complicated things, but it also made me a lot more organized to have to do the COVID thing as like restrictions were lifted and then they were thrown back into place and like all this other stuff. Like it, it challenged me in a way that I didn't, I wasn't challenging, it forced me to get to know my residents a lot better, which is really good. So I highly recommend five star senior living for any activity scene. Um, I don't even remember how I got on this engine. Sorry, guys. Um, my command. Okay, <laughs> so like, uh, where is this? In relationships, he's obviously to seek plainly. I'm sorry. I don't even know. Okay, here we go. Basically, good guys. So hospice, I did that. Okay, ideas for action. Okay, I did stop at a good stopping point. Okay, you will always be ready to confront. Practice the words, the tone, and the techniques that will turn your ability to confront into real persuasiveness. In your relationships, seize opportunities to speak plainly. Seize opportunities to speak plainly. Um, and directly about sensitive subjects, your unwillingness to hide from the truth can become a source of strength and constancy, constancy for your colleagues and friends. Strive to become known as a candid person. Ask people for their opinions. Sometimes your candor will be intimidating, causing others to tread lightly for fear of your reaction. Watch for this. If necessary, explain that you are upfront simply because it feels uncomfortable to keep things bottled up, not because you want to frighten other people into silence. Partner with someone with strong woo or empathy talents. Some obstacles do not need to be confronted. They can be circumvented. This person can be help, can help you avoid obstacles through relationships. Your take charge attitude steadies and reassures others in times of crisis. When faced with a particularly trying challenge, use your command talents to assuage assuage others fears and convince that's the word I got to look up and convince them you have things under control your command talents might compel you to wrestle for the reins of power because you love being in the driver's seat my mom is like this guys but remember that even when you are not formally in charge your presence can be an unseen yet powerfully felt force step up and break bottlenecks Others count on your natural decisiveness to get things moving. When you remove roadblocks, you often create new momentum and success that would not have existed without you. Consider taking the lead on a commi committee. You have definitive, de definite ideas. I need to read this to my mom and my grandmother because neither of them are doing anything with their lives that is commanding and they're commanding each other and me and striving me nuts. Okay. Like my mom commands whatever, everybody. And like literally everybody in our family and pisses everybody off constantly. Like they need her to command them because they won't do it themselves. But like, she just like, she just, she gets like bitchy about it. And like, nobody wants to deal with her. So like, then we're all arguing and complaining about her behind her back. And then I'm telling her what everybody's complaining about behind her back. Cause I personally hate gossip. So like, if someone says something about someone else, I, I go to that person, like this person said this about you, just so you know. I told them I didn't want to continue this conversation. I told them to go to you and they just kept talking. So anyway, your take charge attitude, your command talents 
might be, compel you to wrestle. Okay, or step up and break bottleneck. Others count on your natural decisiveness to get things moving when you remove roadblocks. You okay? I read that. Consider taking the lead on a committee. Okay, I already read that. Um, seek roles in which you will be asked to persuade others. Consider whether selling would be a good career for you. Find a cause you believe in and support it. You might discover yourself at your best when defending a cause in the face of resistance. Working with others who have command. Always ask this person for evaluations of what's happening in your organization. He is likely to give you a straight answer. In the same vein, look to him to raise ideas that are different from your own. He isn't likely to be a head nodder when you need to jar a project loose and get things moving again, or when people need to be persuaded, look to this person to take charge. Never threaten this person unless you are 100% ready to follow through. Okay, communication. You like to explain to describe to host. This is definitely me. I have three strengths so far, guys. You like to explain to describe to host to speak in public and to write. This is your communication theme at work. Ideas are a drying begin a dry beginning. Events are static. You feel a need to bring them to life, to energize them, to make them exciting and vivid. And so you turn events into stories and practice telling them. You take the dry idea and enliven it with images and examples and metaphors. You believe that most people have a very short attention span. They are bombarded by information, but very little of it survives. You want your information, whether an idea, an event, a product's features and benefits or a discovery or a lesson to survive. You want to divert your attention towards you and then capture it, lock it in. This is what drives your hunt for the perfect phrase. This is what draws you toward dramatic words and powerful word combinations. This is why people like to listen to you. Your word pictures pique their interests, sharpen their world, and inspire them to act. Oh, I hope you guys feel that way. Okay, communication sounds like this. Sheila K., general manager of a theme park. Stories are the best way to make my point. Yesterday, I wanted to show my executive committee the impact we can have on our guests. So I shared this story with them. One of our employees brought her father to the flag raising ceremony we have for Veterans Day here at the theme park. He was disabled during World War II and he now has a rare form of cancer and has had a lot of surgery. He's dying. At the start of the ceremony, one of our employees said to the group, this man is a World War II veteran. Can we give him a hand? Everybody cheered and his daughter started crying. Her dad took off his hat. He never takes off his hat because of the scars on his head from the war and the cancer surgery. But when the national anthem started, he took off his hat and bowed his head. His daughter told me that later that it was the best day he's had in years. Tom P, banking executive, my most recent client thought that the flow of capital toward internet stocks was just a passing phase. I tried using a rational argument to change his mind, but he couldn't or wouldn't be convinced. In the end, as I often do when faced with a client in denial, I resorted to imagery. I told him that he was like a person sitting on a beach with his back to the sea. The internet was like a fast rising tide. No matter how comfortable he felt right now, the tide was rising with each crashing wave. And very soon, one of those waves would come crashing down over his head and engulf him. He got to the point. He got the point. Margaret D, marketing director, I once read a book about giving speeches that gave two suggestions. Talk only about things you're really passionate about and always use personal examples. I immediately started doing that and I found lots of stories because I have kids and grandkids and a husband. I build my stories around my personal experiences because everyone can relate to them. Definitely. Okay, ideas for action. You will always do well in roles that require you to capture people's attention. Think about a career in teaching, sales, marketing, ministry, or the media. Your communication talents are likely to flourish in these areas. Start a collection of stories or phrases that resonate with you. For example, cut out magazine articles that move you or write down powerful word combinations. Practice telling these stories or say these words out loud by yourself. Listen to yourself actually say the words we find. Examples, guys. Okay. So every year with my one of my groups that I hang out with, it's called Women Who Run the Hill Country. I've been meeting with them for a few years now. We do a vision board every year. So every year we go through magazines and we pick out what we want our year to look like, what our theme is. So this one was from 2021. Um, I have not done one for 2022 because we did a journaling exercise this year instead. So it says you can do it, the power of friendship, keep pets, keep your pets smiling, being part of life's little moments during bipolar depression because I have bipolar depression, destination, the secret, uh, something, I put something over it. Good is straightforward. Focus on a few essential elements and you're on your way to true wellness. Um, once you show that you want to learn, it helps open a door 
and begin a conversation, mission, eat like a fit food, um, enjoy the great outdoors, growth, truly happy inside. And then I have like pictures of people by the beach. I have a family because Aaron and I talked about adopting. I have somebody dancing. I have somebody running, biking and swimming because I wanted to do a sprint triathlon. I have two old people hiking because that's like the dream is to like hike with my husband until we're old and gray. Um, I have somebody in a field of sunflowers. I really like sunflowers and daisies. Those are my two favorite flowers. Um, I have somebody with a awesome hat. If you guys watch my dance videos, you know I have like seven hats that I use. <laughs> I love my accessories. Okay, back to this. Okay, when you are presenting, pay close attention to your audience. Watch the reaction to each part of your presentation. You will notice that some parts are especially engaging. Afterwards, take time to identify the moments that particularly caught the audience's attention. Draft your next presentation around these highlights. Practice improvisation has a certain appeal, but in general, an audience will respond best to a presenter who knows where he or she is headed. Counterintuitively, the more prepared you are, the more natural your improvisations will appear. Identify your most beneficial sounding boards and audiences, the listeners who seem to bring out your best communication. Examine these individuals or groups to learn why you are so good when you speak with them or to them and look for the same qualities in potential partners and audiences. Keep getting smarter about the words you use. They are a critical currency. Spend to hunt them wisely and monitor their impact. Your communication talents can be highly effective when your message has substance. Don't rely on your talents alone. Take your communication to the level of strength by developing your knowledge and expertise in specific areas. You are a gifted, you are gifted in fostering dialogue among peers and colleagues. Use your communication talents to summarize the various points in a meeting and to build consensus by helping others see what they have in common. If you enjoy writing, consider publishing your work. If you enjoy public speaking, make a presentation at a professional meeting or convention. In either case, your communication talents will serve to assist you in finding just the right way to frame your ideas and state your purpose. Your delight in sharing your thoughts with others. So find the medium that best fits your voice and message. Volunteer for opportunities to present. You can become known as someone who helps people express their thoughts and ambitions in a captivating way. Okay, working with others who have communication. This person finds it easy to carry on a conversation. Ask her to come to social gatherings, dinners, or any events where you want to entertain prospects or customers. Take the time to hear about this person's life and experiences. She will enjoy telling you and you will enjoy listening and your relationship will be closer because of it. Discuss plans for your organization's social events with this person. She is likely to have good ideas both for entertainment and for what should be communicated at the event. Competition. Three, four. Okay, I'm trying to get four more done, guys. Competition. Competition is rooted in comparison. When you look at the world, you are instinctively aware of other people's performance. This perform their performance is the ultimate yardstick. No matter how hard you tried, no matter how worthy your intentions, if you reached your goal but did not outperform your peers, the achievement feels hollow. Like all competitors, you need other people. You need to compare. If you can compare, you can compete. And if you can compete, you can win. And when you win, there is no feeling quite like it. I hate competitive people. Okay, you like measurement because it facilitates comparisons. You like other competitors because they invigorate you. You like contests because they must produce a winner. You particularly like contests where you know you have the inside trap to be the winner. Although you are gracious to fellow to your fellow competitors and even stoic, in defeat, you don't compete for fun of competing. You compete to win. Over time, you will com come to avoid contests where winning seems unlikely. Competition sounds like this. Mark L, sales executive. I've played sports my entire life, and I don't just play to have fun. Let me put it that way. I like to engage in sports. I'm going to win and not once I'm going to lose. Because if I lose, I'm outwardly gracious but inwardly infuriated. Harry D, general manager. I'm not a big sailor, but I love the America's Cup. Both boats are supposed to be exactly the same, and both crews have top-notch athletes, but you always get a winner. One of them had some secret up their sleeves that tipped the balance and enabled them to win more often than lose. And that's what I'm looking for, that secret, that tiny edge. Sumner Redstone, chairman of Viacom, now known as CBS Corporation, on his efforts to acquire that company, I relished <coughs> every minute of it because Viacom – was a company worth fighting for, and I enjoyed a contest. If you get involved in a major comp competitive struggle and the stress that inevitably comes with it, you'd better derive 
some real sense of satisfaction and enjoyment from the ultimate victory. Wrestling control of a company like Bicom was warfare. I believe the real lesson it taught me was that it is not about money. It's about the will to win. Ideas for action. Select work environments in which you can measure your achievements. You might not be able to discover how good you can be without competing. List the performance scores that help you know where you stand every day. What scores should you pay attention to? Identify a high achieving person against whom you can measure your own achievement. If there is more than one, list all the people with whom you currently compete. Without measure, how will you know if you won? Try to turn ordinary tasks into competitive games. You will get more done this way. When you win, take the time to investigate why you won. You can learn a great deal from more from a victory than from a loss. Let people know that being competitive does not equate with putting others down. Explain that you derive satisfaction from pitting yourself against good, strong competitors and winning. Develop a balanced metric, a measurement system that will monitor all aspects of your performance, even if you are competing against your own previous numbers. This measurement will help you give proper attention to all aspects of your performance. When competing with others, create development opportunities by choosing to compare yourself to someone who is slightly above your current level of expertise. Your competition will push you to refine your skills and knowledge to exceed those of that person. Look one or two levels above you for a role model who will push you to improve. Take the time to celebrate your wins. In your world, there is no victory without celebration. Design some mental strategies that can help you deal with a loss. Armed with these strategies, you will be able to move on to the next challenge much more quickly. Working with others who have competition. Use competitive language with this person. It is a win-lose world for him. So from his perspective, achieving a goal is winning and missing a goal is losing. Help this person find places where he can win. If he loses repeatedly, he may stop playing. Remember in the contest that matter to him. He doesn't compete for the fun of it. He competes to win. When this person loses, he may need to mourn for a while. Let him. Then help him quickly move into another opportunity to win. Connectedness. Things happen for a reason. You are sure of it. You are sure of it because in your soul, you know that we are all connected. Yes, we are individuals responsible for our own judgments and in possession of our own free will, but nonetheless, we are part of something larger. Some may call it the collective unconscious. Others may label it spirit or life force. But whatever your word of choice, you, you gain confidence from knowing that we are not isolated from one another or from the earth and the life on it. This feeling of connectedness implies certain responsibilities. If we are all part of a larger picture, then we must not harm others because we will be harming ourselves. We must not exploit because we will be exploiting other, ourselves. You, oh, Your awareness of these responsibilities creates your value system. You are considerate, caring, and accepting. Certain of the unity of humankind, you are a bridge builder for people of different cultures. Sensitive to the invisible hand, you can give others comfort that there is a purpose beyond our, human, our humdrum lives. The exact articles of your faith will depend on your upbringing and your culture, but your faith is strong. It sustains you and your close friends in the face of life's mysteries. Connectedness sounds like this. This one's probably me too, guys. I'm <laughs> just a bunch of them. Okay. Connectedness sounds like this. Mandy M. Homemaker. Humility is the essence of connectedness. You have to know who you are and who you aren't. I have a piece of the wisdom. I don't have much of it, but what I do have is real. This isn't grandosity. This is a real humility. You have confidence in your gifts, real confidence, but you know you don't have all the answers. You start to feel connected to others because you know they have wisdom that you don't. You can feel connected if you think you have everything. Rose T. Psychologist. Sometimes I look at my bowl of cereal in the morning and think about those hundreds of people who are involved in bringing me my bowl of cereal. The farmers in the field, the biochemists who made the pesticides, the warehouse workers at the food preparation plants, even the marketers who somehow persuaded me to buy this box of cereal and not a different one sitting next to it on the shelf. I know it sounds strange, but I give thanks to these people. And just doing that makes me feel more involved with life, more connected to things, less alone. 
Chuck M. Teacher, I tend to be very black and white about things, but when it comes to understanding the mysteries of life, for some reason, I am much more open. I have a big interest in learning about all different religions. I'm reading a book right now that talks about Judaism versus Christianity versus the religion of the Canaanites, Buddhism, Greek mythology. It's really interesting how all these things tie together in some way. Okay. Ideas of action or action. Okay. Consider rules in which you listen and counsel. You can become adept at helping other people see connection and purpose in everyday occurrences. Explore specific ways to expand your sense of connection, such as starting a book club, attending a retreat, or joining an organization that puts connectedness into practice. Within your organization, help your colleagues understand how their efforts fit in the larger picture. You can be a leader in building teams and helping people feel important. You are aware of the boundaries and borders created within organization and communities, but you treat these as seamless and fluid. Use your connectedness talents to break down silos that prevent sharing knowledge. Help people see the connections among their talents, their actions, their mission, and their successes. When people believe in what they are doing and feel like they are part of something bigger, commitment to achievement is enhanced. Partner with someone with strong communication talents. This person can help you with the words you need to describe vivid examples of connection in the real world. Don't spend too much time attempting to persuade others to see the world as linked web. Be aware that your sense of connection is intuitive. If others don't share your intuition, rational argument will not persuade them. Your philosophy of life compels you to more beyond to move beyond your own self-interest in the interest of your immediate cons- constituency and sphere of influence. As such, you see the broader implications for your community and the world. Explore ways to communicate these insights to others. Seek out global or cross-cultural responsibilities that capitalize on your understanding of the commonalities inherent in humanity. Build your universal capability and charge, change the mindset of those who think in terms of us and them. Connectedness talents can help you look past the outer shell of a person to embrace his or her humanity. Be particularly aware of this when you work with someone whose background is very different from yours. You can naturally look past the labels and focus on his or her essential needs. Working with others who have connectedness. This person will likely have social issues that she will defend strongly. Listen closely to know what inspires this passion in her. Your acceptance of these issues will influence the depth of the relationship you can build with her. Encourage this person to build bridges to the different groups in your organization. She naturally thinks about how things are connected, so she should excel at showing different people how each relies on the others. If you also have dominant connectedness, talents, share articles, writings, and expert and experiences with this person, you can reinforce each other's focus. Consistency. Where are we at? 42, 1, 2. Okay, it's true left. I'm going to try to power through these take only an hour for this, but it's going to be an hour. Sorry. Consistency. Balance is important to you. You are keenly aware of the need to treat people the same, no matter what their station in in life. I'm also this one. Okay. So many C's. Okay. With no matter what their station in life. So you do not want to see the scales tip too far in any one, um, any one person's favor. In your view, this leads to selfishness and individualism. Yep. It leads to a world where some people gain an unfair advantage because of their connections or their background or their greasing of the wheels. This is truly offensive to you. Absolutely. You see yourself as a guardian against it. In direct contrast to this world of special favors, you believe that people function best in a consistent environment where the rules are clear and are applied to everyone equally. This is an environment where people know what is expected. It is predictable and even-handed. It is fair. Here, each person has an even a chance to show his or her worth. Consistency sounds like this. Simon H., hotel general manager. I often remind my senior, senior managers that they shouldn't be abusing their parking privileges or using their position to take golf tee times when there are guests waiting. They hate my drawing attention to this, but I'm just the kind of person who dislikes people abusing their perks. I also spend a great deal of time with our hourly employees, I have tremendous respect for them. Jamie K, magazine editor. I am the person who always roots for the underdog. Yeah. I hate it when people don't get a fair shot because of some circumstance in their life that they couldn't control. To put some teeth to this, I am going to set up a scholarship at my alma mater so that journalism students of limited 
means can do internships in the real world without having to keep paying for their college tuition. That's genius. I was lucky when I was an intern at New York at NBC, my family could afford it. Some families can't, but those students should still get a fair shot. Ben F, operations manager, always give credit where credit is due. What? That's my motto. If I am... If I am in a meeting and I bring up an idea that one of my staff actually came up with, I make sure to publicly attribute the idea to that person. Why? Because my bosses always did that with me. And now it seems like the only fair and proper thing to do. Ideas for action. Make a list of the rules of consistency by which you can live. These rules might be based on certain values that you have or on certain policies that you consider non-negotiables. Contraintuitively, the more clear you are about these rules, the more comfortable you will be with individuality within these boundaries. Seek roles in which you can be a force for leveling the playing field. At work or in the community, become a leader in helping provide disadvantaged people with a platform they need to show their true potential. Cultivate a reputation for pinpointing those who really deserve credit. Make sure that that respect is always given to those who truly perform that work. You can become known as the conscience of your organization or group. Find a role in which find a role in which you can enforce compliance to a set of standards. Always be ready to challenge people who break the rules or grease the wheels to earn an unfair advantage for themselves. Keep your focus on performance. Your consistency talents might occasionally lead you to overemphasize how someone gets work done and ignore what he or she gets done. Because you value equality, you find it hard to deal with individuals who bend the rules to fit their situation. Your consistency talents can help you clarify rules, policies, and procedures in ways that will ensure that they are applied uniformly across the board. Consider drafting protocols to make sure that these rules are clearly stated. Partner with someone with powerful maximizer or individualization talents. This person can remind you when it is appropriate to accommodate individual differences. Always practice what you preach. This sets the tone for equality and encourages peaceful compliance. Others will appreciate your natural commitment to consistency between what you have promised and what you will deliver. Always stand up for what you believe, even in the face of strong resistance. You will reap long lasting benefits. Leverage your consistency talents when you have to communicate not so pleasant news. You can be naturally adept at helping others appreciate the rationale between decisions, which will make the situation easier on them and you. Working with others who have consistency. Be supportive of this person during times of great change because she is most comfortable with predictable patterns that she knows work well. Mm -hmm. This person has a practical bent and thus will tend to prefer getting tasks accomplished and decisions made rather than doing more abstract work such as brainstorming or long range planning. When it comes time to recognize others after the completion of a project, ask this person to pinpoint everyone's contributions. She will make sure that each person receives the accolades he or she truly deserve. Context. Last one, guys, and then we'll take a breather. Okay. Still got like 10 minutes, 13 minutes. Okay. You look back. You look back because that is where the answers lie. You look back to understand the present. From your vantage point, the present is unstable, a confusing clamor of competing voices. It is only by casting your mind back to an earlier time, a time when the plans were being drawn up, that the present regains its stability. The earlier time was a simpler time. It was a time of blueprints. As you look back to see these, this is definitely me too, guys. Contents. Like <laughs> 20 of these. Okay, what are your strengths? I have many, so many strengths. Okay, give me a job interview right now, I'm ready. Okay, it is only by casting your mind back to an earlier time, a time when the plans were being okay. The earlier time was a simple earlier time, but as you look back, you begin to see the blueprints emerge. You realize what the initial intentions were. These blueprints or intentions have since become so embellished that they are almost unrecognizable. But now this context theme reveals them again. This understanding brings you confidence. No longer disoriented, you make better decisions because you sense the underlying structure. You become a better partner because you understand how your colleagues came to be who they are. And counterintuitively, you become wiser about the future because you got seeds being sown in the past. I love that. Faced with new people and new situations, it will take you a little time to orient yourself, but you must give yourself this time. You must discipline yourself to ask the questions and allow the blueprints to emerge because no matter what the situation, if you haven't seen the blueprints, you will have less confidence in your decisions. 
literally on contracts, you guys. I think that's like my strongest one. I focus on like so many like like I have friends that I've had since like preschool. I have friends that I've had since like high school. I've had friends like and I go to them for like those are like the relationships I value the most because they know me the best. Like they know me better than like anyone else. Like they know like where I came from. They know when like issues started. Like they might have missed out on like, like a few years of my life, but like those are the people that I want like by my side for the rest of my life because they know like it's just easier to have a relationship with someone that knows everything about you and like knows where you came from and like where you started. Like, it's just so much easier. So like, I love those people and value them the most and their opinions matter to me more than anyone else's. Like, yeah, my mom, like she's known me the longest out of everyone, but she knows me the least of everyone. And she makes sure that everyone knows how terrible and horrible of a human being I am because I have bipolar disorder. My mom, every therapist I've ever said is like, you need to end this relationship with your mom. She's damaging your mental health, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I can't, she's my mom. I love her, even though she's a mess, but she's been diagnosed by three of my therapists as psycho schizophrenic bipolar one, which is the worst, like hardest, most difficult bipolar disorder. Mine luckily is very minor um, compared to that. And then she also has PTSD. So she has all three of these very awful, traumatizing, horrible mental illnesses. And what does she do about them? There's nothing wrong with me, Chelsea. It's all you. Yeah, she's a nightmare. Okay, Adam Y, sophomore designer. I tell, and like, if you don't treat mental illness, it gets worse. It gets worse and it gets worse. She gets more abusive. I'm in my 30s. She's more abusive now than she was when I was a child. Like, had to call the cops on, like, myself because I started, like, beating her up because I was doing this IFS training thing. It's internal family systems. Like, literally do some research on you guys. It's really, really genius. It's been like the most therapeutic and helpful for any of my PTSD. Like it's basically cured it. So basically like I was doing a lot of work on P on my PTSD with this IFS training and my therapist. And like, I had a confrontation with my mom and I just like tapped her gently and then she tapped me back, but harder. And then I tapped her harder and literally it just escalated. And I just started wailing at her. I blacked out for a moment. She said, like, I was looking at her like I was demon possessed and I was just like wailing on her, like, and her dog started attacking me because I live in Texas. She lives in Wisconsin. So her dog doesn't really know me. She doesn't train her dogs either. And she's abusive to her dogs. Um, so she's abusive to them and then she feels bad about it. So then she spoils them. And like, it's just, it's like a vicious cycle with the woman. So like, basically there's no structure in her house. There was never structure when I was growing up as a kid, like she tried. And then my dad just kind of said whatever. And so because she didn't have a good partner, like she just, she, her and my dad should have gotten divorced. Like when I was two, when they originally talked about, to be honest with you, but they were married until he died. And I was 32 when he died and they married three years, two or three years before. I, so like 40 years, they were married almost not that long, 36, they were 36 years. I don't know, something like that. So anyway, Lutherans don't get divorced if there's an abusive relationship. You just don't do that. Okay, Adam Y, sophomore designer. I tell my people, let's avoid vuja day, vuja day. And they say, isn't that the wrong word? Shouldn't it be deja vu? And I say, no, vuja day means that we're bound to repeat the mistakes of our past. We must avoid this. We must look to our past, see what led to our mistakes, and then not make them again. It sounds obvious, but most people don't look to their past or don't trust that it was valid or something. And so for them, it's Vuja Day all over again. Jesse K, media analyst, I have very little empathy, so I don't relate to people through their present emotional state. Instead, I relate to them through their past. In fact, I can't even begin to understand people until I found out where they grew up, what their parents were like, and what they studied in college. Greg H, accounting manager, I recently moved the whole office to a new accounting system and the only reason it worked was that I honored their past. When the people, when people build an accounting system, it's their blood, sweat, and tears. It's them. They are personally identified with it. So if I come in and blandly tell them that I'm going to change it, it's like me saying I'm going to take your baby away. That's the level of emotion I was dealing with. I had to respect this connection, this history, or they would have rejected me out of hand. Props to you, dude. Okay, ideas for action. Before planning begins on a project, encourage the people involved to study past projects. Help them appreciate the statement. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. If you are in a role that requires teaching others, build your lessons around case studies. You will enjoy the search for the appropriate case, and your students will learn from these precedents. Use your understanding of the past to help others map the future. 
at work help your organization strengthen its culture via folklore. For example, collect symbols and stories that represent the best of the past or suggest naming an, an award after a person who embodied the historical traditions of your organization. Partner with someone with strong futuristic or strategic talents. This person's fascination with what could be will stop you from becoming mired in the past, while your deep understanding of context will stop him or her from ignoring the lessons of the past. Together, you are more likely to create something that lasts, except change. Remember that your context talents do not require you to live in the past. Instead, you can actually become known as an active agent for positive change. Your natural sense of context should allow you to identify more clearly than most than most the aspects of the past that can be discarded. That does not make any sense. Your natural sense of context should allow you to identify more clearly than most the aspects. Okay, than most the aspects of the past that can be discarded. Okay, that does make sense. And those that must be retained to build a sustainable future. Use fact-based comparison to prior successes to paint a vivid picture for others of what can be in the future. The real life illustrations you create can build confidence and emotional engagement. You recognize that the best predictor for future of future behavior is past behavior. Probe your friends and coworkers about actions that might have contributed to their current successes so you can help them better make better choices in the future. This will help them put their decisions into an overall context. Read historical novels, nonfiction, or biographies. You will discover many insights that will help you understand the present. You will think more clearly. Compare historical antecedents and situations to your current challenge. Identifying commonalities may lead you to a new perspective or an answer to your problems. Seek out mentors who have a sense of history. Listening to their memories is likely to spark your thoughts process. Working with others who have contexts. Just gonna tell my mentor it's like one time. Okay. So my biggest mentors have been my grandpa Art, um, my dad, who was not the best mentor to me, but he got better over the years. He was terrible in grade school, but then college and high school, like he came into his own and he became like a good dad finally. Took him like 14 years to do that. A little frustrating, but anyway. Um, and then he he was a really good dad when I was in college and he was a really good dad in my twenties and thirties. And then he died from pancreatic cancer stage four. Um, so I'll have some tribute stuff to him next week, guys. Um, like our song that we danced to at my wedding, I'm going to do a, I'm going to dance to it. And then there's another song that I'm going to sing to that I really like. Um, that reminds me of my dad. And every time I hear it, I like start crying, but I've gotten better at not like crying. And then, um, my, my father-in-law, my ex-father-in-law, former father, I don't know what you would call it. Like, what do you call it? So like, we're divorced now. So what would you call it? He's, so he's dead. And he, when he died, he was still my father-in-law and I got removed from the obituary, which was really upsetting to me because we were still technically still married, but because we were getting a divorce, they just, his family is a bunch of assholes. So they just removed me completely from the obituary, which was really disheartening, especially since I like was really excited that he was doing a handwritten obituary and he wanted it or he was doing a written obituary typed obituary and he was putting it in the newspaper and he had all these months like four months to write his obituary and that was like his legacy that he was leaving behind and I was so excited to read it um and the day he died it like came out that night and like I wasn't included in it and my stepdaughter wasn't included in the one that he's been like ashamed of forever because she was born out of wedlock um and the woman basically It's basically rape. Um, she brought over a higher proof alcoholic beverage, but he agreed to drink it. So he was unconscious when the whole thing happened. And she like reminded him what happened in the morning. And he was like terrified. And like, she showed up like months, like apparently she's done this before. She showed up like months later and said, um, I'm pregnant. It's yours. You need to put money in my bank account. And he's like, what? Like, you told me you can't get pregnant. Like, we had this conversation. Like, I said, you should take a morning after pill. Like, what about getting an abortion? Like, what are like, and she's like, that's not very Christian to get an abortion. And she's like, basically, she just wanted a man to take care of her. And she has one. She married a man who's very rich and like loves her and cares about her and gave her a second child. And like, anyway, so um, it was just very difficult because Aaron had a lot of shame for his stepdaughter and like didn't fight for her as well as he probably should have. And like, 
um, paid a really high amount of child support and was in a lot of debt when I met him, um, put everything on credit cards, like his lawyer fees is like, everything is pretty, pretty awful. I mean, the child support came out of his paycheck, but it was like literally his whole paycheck. And he just like dealt with it by drinking a lot, um, which isn't good. And then he's like a very flirty drunk. So I realized why she thought that it was consensual because when he's drunk, no matter how drunk he is, he's very handsy with like everyone, not just like the woman he's with, with literally everyone. So we broke up like two times because of that shit. Um, and then the next time, like, and then he stopped and he was like remorseful and like repentant and like drunk, doing other things as distractions instead of alcohol, which was putting him out of control. And so like, um, then my 30th birthday, he got really drunk and like, I kept asking him to dance with me and he kept saying, no, he doesn't want to dance. He just wants to hang out with his friends at the bar or whatever. And I was like, fine, whatever. I play out with your fucking friends at the bar. And so then I'm on the dance floor and I see my husband dancing with some like sleazy middle-aged hoe bag. And she's just like, she's like literally like all over him. And he's just like dancing like an idiot. And I like stare at him and he like finally sees me. And then he starts to get like uncomfortable. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And so like, I storm up to this woman. I'm like, excuse me. I'd like to dance with my husband. And she's like, She's like your husband. And then she's like, honey, he's dancing with me. And I'm just like, really? Because I've been asking him all night to dance with me. And he hasn't done it. And today's my 30th birthday. And she looks at me. She's like, I'm so sorry. I'm married too. I know how it is. And I'm like, do you? If you're married too, why are you all over my husband? And she's just like, she's like, I'm sorry. Do you want to dance with us? I was like, no, I want you to go away. Like, I think you're disgusting and gross. And like, your husband should be here with you. And if you have issues in your marriage, that's your own fucking problem. But don't be all over my husband. And so she's like, She's like, girl, I like you. I was like, yeah, I don't like you. Go away. And so she like leaves. <laughs> then I look at Aaron and then he's like, do you want to dance? And I was like, no, I don't want to fucking dance. I was like, go sit with your fucking friends at the bar because you couldn't fucking dance with your wife. And I was like, if I see you up here dancing with another woman again, I'm going to fucking kill you, dude. And so he's like, got it. And so like he leaves, he goes over and like he, later on he comes over and he dances with me and it's fine. But like, <laughs> glad we're divorced. Okay. Working with others who have contact. During meetings, always turn to the person to review what's being done, what's been done, and what's been learned. Instinctively, he will want others to be aware of the context of decision making. This person thinks in terms of case studies. When did we face a similar situation? We what did we do? What happened? What did we learn? You can expect him to use this talent to help others learn, especially when the need for anas. Uh, as, I just said it. Antidotes, antidotes, antid I, whatever. Illustrations is important. When you introduce this person to new colleagues, ask them to talk about their backgrounds before you get done down to business. Okay, we'll talk. Pick up deliberate and the others next time. Later.